basically when they are playing football in Robben Island and all the organization, the federation or uh, referees and players, they going out from the Robben Island, they are, they will, they were free after that. I think uh, it was best described by Tony Sousa, who was one of the best players on the island. He said for that morning, that Saturday morning when he was playing, or for that matter, the other Saturday mornings when he was watching, it almost seemed as though the guards forgot to lock him in that day. He felt like he was back in Pretoria. Uh, you brought up referees. There's, there's something else that I think is quite distinctive about the, the passion with which they organize football. If you look at a, a football program, for instance in England, the referee, they always tell you what town he's from and he's always from someplace other than the two cities where the, the teams are from. And most people think that's because you don't want a referee who's going to be in favor. Well, there's another reason. You don't want a referee who's going to have to go home at the end of a match and live amongst the people that he might have decided against. Now, all of the men in the Makana FA, all the men on Robben Island are living in a communal prison, which means a referee makes a decision one day, one Saturday morning, and one team is offended by the decision and he's got to live with these guys. He has to shower with them. He has to break rocks with them. Why would anybody in their right mind consent to be a referee living in a closed community? There's only one reason. Yep. And that's it's an obligation. They felt that you couldn't have football without referees. Everybody hates referees. There are only, only, two re, only two feelings people have against referees. If they like them, they ignore them, and if they don't ignore them, they hate them. And here you had the prisoners on Robben Island who were going to referee one Saturday, and they were going to be playing in matches the following Saturday. And it's, it says something about their dedication to the sport, that anybody was willing to accept being a referee. You told when you were in the conference, uh, Bill Shankly says football not death or life, football more than import important than death and life. When I heard this story, yeah, I understand. And now I'm looking at today football world, all of the show business and all of the all of the money. That's a different thing. Actually, that is a real spiritual, the real soul, the sport and football. That is a real soul of football. Well, first of all, the Bill Shankly quote, we're not sure whether he was joking. I have a suspicion that he probably wasn't joking. And if he wasn't joking, it's a really stupid thing to say. But it does sum up uh, how he felt about football. I have a slightly different take. Um, I've known a few professional athletes. And I don't, I'm not offended the least bit by the amount of money in football. Uh, because if the players didn't get it, somebody would. It's, it's, I've studied sports back home. I've studied baseball, which has enormous salaries. And my reaction has always been, I don't think the player's overpaid. If the club can afford it, then why shouldn't the player get it? One of the things I think we forget is I can't imagine any professional athlete who is good enough to make a lot of money who doesn't have a passion for the sport, if he didn't have that passion, or she didn't have that passion, they wouldn't be good enough in the first place. So I don't think that, that we can draw a distinction between people who get paid a lot and people who love the sport. I think the one comes from the other. Now, come back to the heart of your question. Uh, what the men on Robben Island loved about football is that first of all, it took them out of Emotionally, it took them out of the island. But secondly, it was something they owned. Uh, five days a week, they had to work all day. The guards told them where to work. They told them how to work. They told them when to get up in the morning. They told them when to go to bed at night. One morning a week, they could do what they wanted. It was their football. And football has a, a unique quality about it. It's a team sport but it's also a sport where you have individual moments of brilliance or stupidity for that matter, but they're not choreographed. They're not planned ahead of time. Nobody tells a player, a manager might think he can, but nobody can actually tell a player at any given moment, here's exactly what you're going to do. Well, the guards could do that for five days a week. 
So for one day a week and after a while for two days a week, two mornings a week, they could, they could be individuals again. They could live lives without restrictions. Well, you think this uh, book and published in Turkey? Have you got any related for any Turkish bookstore? Um, published store? I have no idea, unfortunately, about the marketing. We were, uh, we were hoping that somebody would actually publish, buy the rights and publish a Turkish edition. I mean, I think the story is universal. And secondly, I think football matters enough to people here. Um, it has been published in, in Dutch and Italian and gotten very good notices there. It's also been published in Czech, Korean and Japanese. I have no idea as to what the sales are there. Uh, I would love to see a Turkish edition. I would love to see a Portuguese edition. I would love to see a Spanish edition. Those are the three that I really miss. Yep. You come constantly in Europe. What about the uh, Europe football? Uh, I know you are very interesting with the uh, English Premiership. What about other ones? Spanish, Turkish, Dutch or German? Uh